All right, it looks like uh, we can start now. Um, welcome to the latest Pediatrust question and answer Ask the Pediatrician webinar, The Other Pandemic, tonight in which we focus on childhood obesity, its prevention and mitigation. I am Ruben Rakova, Medical Director for Pediatrust and your host for tonight's session. Our panel tonight includes, and if you can give a little wave when I announce your name, so people can put a face to a name, Dr. Christine McGuire, pediatrician at Fairview Pediatrics in Grays Lake. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Carolina Stack, pediatrician at Pediatric Associates of Barrington uh, with offices in Barrington and Crystal Lake. And Marissa Persky, pediatrician nutritionist who sees patients at multiple sites and online among all of our pediatrist offices. Our session tonight will be an hour long and will be recorded. We'll be sending out an email to everyone who registered for the event in the next few days. And in the email will be a link to the recording. We've had questions coming in for the past few weeks and we'll get to as many of those as we can. But those of you watching tonight can also submit questions either through the chat function of the Zoom call or through Facebook Live. And we'll try to get to some of those as well. So let's get started. We'll open up the questions with one about why this topic is so important. Dr. Stack, what can you tell us about the risk factors of obesity in terms of long-term consequences with respect to diabetes, heart disease, and other conditions? And specifically, one parent asked, does a child's risk of developing type 2 diabetes increase if one of his parents has it, regardless of the child's weight or activity? Yeah, absolutely. So I think those are definitely great questions and a great way to start off this webinar. So this um, session is aptly named the the other pandemic because obesity is highly prevalent in our, you know, um, community. And so about 20% of our children and adolescents are affected by obesity. And so obviously we do have to talk about this. And so specifically, um, obesity is associated with metabolic syndrome. And so it can be associated with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and all of these put you at higher risk for early core coronary um, heart disease and stroke. And actually, obesity has also been found um, to be related to different cancers as well. Um, so specifically, stomach cancer, liver cancer, um, colorectal, endometrial best breast cancers. So it definitely has a wide range of different health effects. And so specifically for the type 2 diabetes risk, um, there is both a genetic and a lifestyle component to it. Um, and genetically, you inherit a predisposition to getting diabetes, but then actually something in the environment and lifestyle changes actually trigger you to have the disease. And so really both type 1 and type 2 diabetes um, have a genetic component to it, but um, actually type 2 diabetes has been found to have a stronger link to family um, history than type 1. Um, and then studies of twins have shown that there is a genetic component to inheriting type 2 diabetes. That being said, you know, type two diabetes may have a stronger link to family history because families tend to have similar eating and exercise habits. And so, you know, that lifestyle component may be um, a bigger portion of it. And so, even though there is a genetic component to it, lifestyle does play a big role. And so it's important to focus on good exercise and good eating habits to you know, potentially delay or even prevent developing type two diabetes. Thank you, very thorough answer, I appreciate that. Uh, the next question came to us in several different forms. Um, Marissa, what do you tell the parent who's concerned about emotional eating habits. One parent specifically asks, my five-year-old is always concerned about whether or not we packed his snacks, making sure he has his meal packed. I wanna make sure he doesn't develop an obsession with food. What do you tell that parent? Yeah, great question. Thanks for having me. Um, I would suggest reflecting on the balance of the meals throughout the day. Are they getting three to four food groups at each meal to promote that fullness and satiety feeling? how many hours are between meals. Um, the rule of three 
uh, food plan is often helpful, which includes establishing eating three meals and three snacks every three hours. This helps teach us to respond appropriately to hunger and fullness cues. If two snacks are more ideal, depending on the age and wake time cycle, then two snacks are just fine. And establishing a schedule and expectations of when the next snack or meal are is also helpful to lower the food talk. Another thing to think about is if the child is hydrating adequately. So um, a lot of adults and children um, confuse being hungry for actually needing to drink. And fluid needs are based on body mass, but in general, most kids above three need uh, around 48 ounces and upward. Um, for a child that seems to speak about eating constantly and is concerned about, you know, when the next meal and snack is, I would dig a bit deeper to see what the function of that behavior is. Um, it may take a seeing a child therapist if it is hard to understand and get an answer from the child, um, but positive reinforcement can be helpful in this situation. Praising the child for feeding their body so well when eating balanced and reminding them how well they just ate and that we need to give our bodies more time sometimes to digest and process the food before eating again. So sometimes just ending the meal if they keep asking for food and just kind of getting out of the kitchen and going and playing is, is, is good to do. Thank you. Um, this next question is a tricky one and it's for Dr. McGuire. Aren't you lucky, Dr. McGuire? Um, we got several questions, all of them asking some variation of this. How can I talk to my child about their weight without making them feel bad, causing self-esteem issues, making it a negative? It's a very tricky, fine line to walk. What do you say, Dr. McGuire? Thank you, Dr. Rakoba. That is a really important question. And families, we're really glad you joined us tonight. I think it's really important that we're careful how we talk to our kids. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not adding to any sort of feelings that they already may have, negative feelings. They may have been bullied at school. You know, kids may be teasing them. And so we don't want to use labels. We don't want to, you know, hurt them and add to kind of the emotional burden that they may already have. Um, about their size. So I try not to directly talk about a child's weight unless I'm asked. So, and if they then directly asked me, then I might say something like, hey, you know how you're really good at math, but you know, you're working more on spelling. We think maybe it might be a good time for our family to work on healthy food choices. Uh, are there um, some foods that you particularly like that you'd like to try, some fruits or vegetables, or even better, take them to the grocery store with you. You know, kids love to go to the grocery store, most kids, and they can help you choose fruits or vegetables, and then they're more likely to eat them. Other families have had success with having their kids help them cook. So even young kids can help you, for instance, wash the green beans, or maybe an older child might pick a recipe that you guys could all cook together. Uh, so again, the emphasis should be on the healthy habits rather than their weight or BMI classification. So just as a quick kind of reminder, what is BMI? BMI is a measure of a patient's or a person's weight for a given height. So say I have a person who is 60 inches tall and their BMI classification is 85%, then that would put them in the overweight category. Uh, obesity is defined, on the other hand, as 95% or greater for a given height. So again, our emphasis when we talk about, talk to our kids and families, it should be not on the BMI or the weight, but the emphasis should be on healthy habits, healthy food choices, and trying to get exercise. Oh, that's all sage advice. This is a very tricky question. So I'd like to have the other two panelists weigh in too. Marissa, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, it's obviously Dr. McGuire covered a lot of ground there, but do you have anything to add? I just agree 100% that avoidance of focusing too much on the weight and um, body mass index and stuff like that really could lead to feelings of shame and guilt surrounding eating. So I think it's great to just focus on the good things that they're doing, how well they're feeding their body and moving their body, yeah. Uh, and Dr. Sam? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I think the emphasis should definitely be on family goals because it's hard to make someone feel isolated that this is their problem when really it's kind of an environmental um, thing to consider and definitely just providing that positive reinforcement for those good healthy choices versus, um, you know, giving punishment or shame for some of those poor choices. Right. And I, I would just echo that. Let's not focus on the number on the scale. In fact, don't even bother taking weights at home frequently or at all even. Um, I know we do when we, they come to the office, but 
Um, you know, let's focus on the, the activity exercise. Let's focus on the activity of eating. Let's focus on healthy eating and why that's important. Going back to all those things that uh, Dr. Stack mentioned in the very first answer. All right, thank you for all of that. Um, uh, Dr. Stack, let's go back to you. One mom throws her husband under the bus with this comment when she says, my husband likes to bribe our child. If you eat more vegetables, you get more pasta. Does this create bad habits? So this is actually very common, but unfortunately, yes, it can create bad habits. Um, and so really we want to encourage kids to have intuitive eating and associate eating healthy foods with feeling healthy versus getting a sugar crash or feeling bloated um, after eating maybe some unhealthy um, foods. And so really kids, um, adolescents, they really have a much better sense of self-regulation than we do as adults. Um, so if they stop eating early, it's okay. They don't have to finish their whole plate. You know, our job as parents is to choose what our children eat. Um, and then their job is to decide how much of it they're going to eat. And so as long as we expose them to those um, healthy meals and snacks um, and not make separate meals for them, um, then they will develop those healthy habits. And we really want to avoid restricting different categories of food um, as this increases our natural cravings for those foods. So it's okay to have sweets and it's okay to have desserts, but it's probably a better idea to kind of plan ahead um, to know how many times per week um, you'll serve that dessert, despite if the child finishes their complete meal and if they finish all of their fruits and vegetables. And we really wanna use kind of non-food items for rewards um, just to kind of decrease that, um, that habit. Good idea. I think the other thing that needs to be said is, you know, um, your words mean things, obviously, it's very important, but your actions speak louder. So you, you wanna model the good behavior that you want to see in your kids. So if you eat a good variety of foods, if you're eating healthy, it's much easier for the kids to see that and pick up on that. So yeah, um, absolutely. You know, always important to model the behavior you want to see. All right. Um, here's a good question for Marissa. If a toddler asks for more food after a full meal, should you give it to them? How do you know when a toddler is truly full? Great question. And some of this is piggybacking what Dr. Stack just said, but um, I think that the best thing to do is to offer your toddler a variety of foods um, with different taste, textures, and colors. And toddlers typically are pretty good and in tune with hunger and fullness cues unless there's feeding difficulties, such as sensory concerns, oral motor difficulties, things like that. Um, and the parent's job is to decide what foods are offered and when and where they are eaten. The goal would be at a table um, and not, you know, chasing your toddler around to get them to finish a food item or because you're worried about this or that. I see that a lot. So, um, and that just puts a lot of pressure on the child. Um, and letting your child decide which of the foods offered he or she will eat and how much to eat. Um, day to day, meal to meal appetite changes are normal. It is important that you don't make your child clean his or her plate. If your toddler finishes a balanced plate and wants more, I would just put a spoonful of each food group on the plate and allow them to continue to eat um, to promote that fullness because obviously they're not full if they're done with that plate that you gave them and they want more. Um, either way, if you gave a little more and then your child feels satisfied, then you're more aware of the volume that promotes fullness for them. If your toddler gets sick because of overdoing it, which is quite rare, um, then it's just maybe an indicator that they're struggling with fullness cues and, and just need your help. Um, but that's about it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> one parent wrote in with this question, eating disorders are very prevalent right now. How can healthy food choices be encouraged without pushing a child into an eating disorder? Dr. McGuire, how do you answer that parent? Yes, we do have to be careful. There is a small but real possibility that some kids will develop an eating disorder. But I think if we look at kind of the numbers, it's much more common that we see kids who are overweight or obese than kids that we see with eating disorders. And so I think we really have to try to encourage our parents um, and our families that have, you know, where the kids are obese or overweight. But again, I think we, it's how we do it. 
So let's think about what our expectations are and how we'll do it. Again, the emphasis is on the healthy habits. Um, not eating is not healthy. Skipping meals isn't healthy. Uh, I also like to follow my overweight patients more frequently. That way I'm kind of getting a feeling for how they're doing. I can encourage them, but I can also be on the lookout for any patients who are having trouble or might be kind of heading towards an eating disorder. Thank I also you. prefer to, oops, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I also like to talk about different body types. So we can control like what we're eating, what we buy at the store, what kind of exercise we're doing. We can't control our genetics. So I think if we focus on, you know, what we're trying to do, that's much more important. Uh, very good advice. Okay. As a follow-up to that, um, this one is for Dr. Stack. How do you protect younger kids from um, eating disorders when they're close to someone, a friend who has an eating disorder? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think the first step is definitely just acknowledging the fact that they are at higher risk of developing an eating disorder. As kids and adolescents, we look more towards our peers and our families. And you know, when you're exposed to it, you're just simply at higher risk. So I think definitely that communication is key. As we have talked about you know, previously, it's all about how you approach the topic, definitely making it low pressure, not an obsessive thing that you're constantly talking about monitoring, weighing this child, you know, reacting to um, their constant, you know, um, eating changes because appetite really does vary day to day. Um, and so as long as, as a general picture, we're healthy, we're having a good variety of foods, um, you know, we're not, um, you know, increasing our weight or anything like that, then I think we're okay. Obviously, there are therapists, there are nutritionists, so utilizing those um, resources um, as needed if any problems develop. Thank you. Uh, Marissa, we had several questions emailed to us, all revolving around the same topic of a child or teen with special health care needs. For example, one parent wrote, my 18-year-old is on the autism spectrum, who will not eat fruits, or vegetables and is overweight. Um, what do you do with those children who can't or won't eat healthy foods due to developmental issues like this child, um, allergies or other healthcare concerns? Sure, great question. So I often see sensory limitations with food getting away with my autistic patient population. Um, I think the main thing to focus on is we want to maintain the joy of eating in a gentle way, encouraging food challenges. Um, without too much pressure or to elicit an emotional response. Um, so it can just be simply by putting a couple bites of the family's meal, um, including fruit or vegetable, if that's the, the food groups that we struggle with, on the plate paired with a comfortable food that they prefer. Even tolerating the food on the plate um, that they dislike can be a huge step in the right direction. Um, and if you, if if there has not been exploration of feeding therapy when they were younger, you can always look into that um, with the occupational therapist or speech language pathologist um, to help with food chaining and food exposures. So this is one of the many things they specialize in. In the meantime, I would just suggest an adult multivitamin since there are not, since they're not literally taking in any fruit or vegetables in the meantime until that increase can happen. And then as far as allergies, specifically oral allergy syndrome, which was part of the question, um, coupled with a poor veggie intake, and the oral allergy was due to most fruits, which is really tough, um, and then coupled with being um, a little overweight, a lot of the advice I just mentioned before attain, um, pertains to this, but also it depends if there are any you know, sensory difficulties or behavioral issues that are getting in the way. When we have poor fruit and veggie intake, you know, coupled with the overweight status, it's important to, for the teen to be able to visualize what an appropriate balanced eating day looks like or, or what they can work towards instead of just maybe making comments that they should eat this, should eat that and stuff like that and just being educated as to why it's important. Um, and this works if they're motivated to explore more foods and change their current eating habits. Um, often boredom of the same foods for meals and snacks sometimes will spark a desire to actually push them in a better direction. Thank you. Um, Dr. McGuire, you deal with a lot with kids who have special health care needs. Do you have anything to add? 
Yeah, I think that um, I like what Marissa said. You know, I think kids with developmental delay are like one and a half times as likely to be overweight and uh, kids with autism closer to twice as likely. So, um, you know, I think that we really have to kind of, you know, try different um, different ways. So some of the things like she talked about, sometimes just touching foods can be helpful. Um, so, and then sometimes we have to just adjust our expectations. So we wouldn't expect a developmentally delayed child to read on grade level. So we may have to just keep in mind that maybe we're not going to be able to achieve the ideal weight or whatnot or the you know ideal behavior that we'd like, but just trying to encourage. And the biggest thing, like so much of parenting, is to try to keep it positive. So we try to not have too many negative comments. Oh, he doesn't like this. Oh, he never eats vegetables. Try to keep them positive. Like maybe he doesn't do eat any vegetables today, but then the next night you know. Wow, he kept those on his plate. That was a great job just keeping them on your plate. Or I like how you touch them. Small steps. Very good. Um, Dr. Stack, one parent uh, wrote in and asked, are you more concerned if the child is underweight or overweight? Yeah, that's a good question. So I know this webinar is more focused of being overweight and being obese, but definitely both are considered to be, you know, health risk factors for different medical problems. And so as we talked about, you know, being overweight and obese has, you know, issues with high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, you know, even cancers, but even being underweight can cause immune issues, bone mineral loss that can, you know, predispose you to osteoporosis and fractures, um, and even menstrual irregularities and infertility. So it's definitely about finding the right balance and avoiding both of those extremes. And just to kind of piggyback on Dr. McGuire's comment about the BMIs for obesity, someone is underweight if their BMI is less than 18.5 or if they are less than the fifth percentile uh, for their age. And then for overweight, as we talked about, if their BMI is between the 85th and 95th percentile. So definitely our goal is to stay between the five and 85%. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McGuire, we're going to come back to you. One mom asked, and this is a very sad commentary on um, social media today, but she asked, my daughter is calling herself fat because of what she sees on Instagram. How can I help? Wow. Yeah, this is really, you know, it's a, it's a problem. So I think you want to make them aware of the filtering that goes on. There's extensive filtering in all these social media sites. A lot of our kids know this, but you know, some of them may just have forgotten it. And so we can remind them uh, it happens in the video. It happens in still photos. So um, remind them of that. And then again, focus on the great things that they do do. So maybe they're really nice, you know, to their sibling, or maybe they helped you vacuum the other night. Uh, or maybe they're really trying hard at English, even though they're not really, even though it's really been a difficult subject for them. So focus again on like the, the positive things. And then finally, let's try to limit uh, electronics. Uh, you know, the kids, the more times they spend on it, we find that there's more depression, more anxiety for kids who spend a lot of time on social media. So, you know, at the end of the day, try to limit it, try and bring them outside and or do some sort of family activity. Good idea. All right. Um... Dr. Sack, I'm going to come back to you. Here's a million dollar question. Every parent wants to know, how do you combat a picky palate? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, really patience is key in all of this. Um, you know, kids and even adults, palates change all the time. So you may be you know, surprised if your kid doesn't eat a, a food that they actually constantly love and constantly eat, and then vice versa. You may be pleasantly surprised when they actually do end up eating a food um, that they normally would not like. I think, you know, with from a speech therapy perspective, from just like a feeding therapy perspective, like we mentioned earlier, it's important to kind of focus on the little steps getting closer and closer to actually eating those, you know, undesired foods. So first, um, um, you know, having them be comfortable with the food being in the center of the table. So them even just looking at it, smelling it, um, you know, from a distance, then being comfortable with the food being on their plate. 
and then them touching it, them, you know, putting it to their lips and putting it a little bit closer. Um, the next step would be putting it in their mouth um, and chewing it, even if they do spit it out. So it's just kind of working the stepwise ladder, getting closer and closer to actually chewing it, swallowing, and then ultimately taking multiple bites. Um, and so really, patience is key, you know, persistence is key. Um, and it's always a good idea to have um, a safe food on the plate um, with like a new or kind of adventurous food on their plate as well that may make them be a little bit more adventurous and willing to try it. And I think it's also important to make mealtime fun. So, you know, trying different utensils, using different dips, like, you know, cooking things like you know, ants on a log using celery and peanut butter. There's just, you know, so many ways to make mealtime fun. Obviously it's very time consuming, um, but it may be a good way to, um, you know, make meals and food more exciting instead of this high pressure thing to eat foods that they don't like. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier, if kids are involved in the grocery shopping process in the cooking process, they're more likely to eat the foods as well. That's all good advice. I may chime in with just two corollaries. One is, particularly if you're talking about toddlers, you're lucky to get one good meal in them in a day. So for this, as a general rule, there are certainly toddlers who, who are outliers, but most will either pick at two meals and eat well and one good meal or just eat one good meal and not really eat the other two meals. And that's okay, provided their weight is fine. Um, the other corollary is, this is one area where the kids have total and complete control. Unless you're willing to literally open up their mouth forcibly and shove food in, which I do not recommend, um, they're going to eat what they want to eat, and there's nothing that you can do to force them to eat anything else. So the point is, don't substitute bad foods for good foods just to get them to eat something. They will eat. No child is going to starve himself. Um, but you also don't want to make it arduous. So if you know your kid doesn't like five, these five foods, don't serve just those five foods at dinner. You know how that's going to turn out. Like Dr. Stack says, have a safe food. I know my kid will eat this, might not like this other stuff. So I'll at least have the one he likes as part of the meal. But don't make it a restaurant, right? If you don't like this, I'll, what do you want? I'll make this. Or if you don't like that, I'll make this. No, this is what's for dinner. Eat it or don't. And, you know, as long as there's a safe food on the table, something you know he'll eat, he won't go to bed hungry. All right. Uh, Marissa, here's a common question. How do you change the mindset of kids not of not needing dessert every night without making the child feel like they're being punished? Great question. So, you know, we don't want our children to think that sweets are untouchable, but we, we want to establish expectations of how often your family chooses to have dessert. I usually suggest two to three times a week following your, allowing your child to choose which days dessert is. So is it on the weekends because that's when there's more social things happening or is it one during the week, one on the weekend? Being flexible and allowing them to choose is helpful because it gives control into their hands. And it often takes looking ahead at the week and changing the days week to week, depending on social engagements too. Um, setting up the expectation that we do not need something sweet every day is a good habit to start. Um, during social situations though, we, we want our children to be able to eat what everyone is eating. So because there's, you know, if there's dessert happening, you're not gonna be like, no, you can't have this. That's that's also not a good thing because um, it could lead to internal thoughts of like shame and feeling different than everyone else. Um, but if a sweet treat is going to be part of a day, it's good to think about timing as desserts don't, don't always have to be in the evening just after dinner. Um, sometimes it's a good idea instead to pair it with an afternoon snack for fun to kind of spice things up and, and comparing it with like a fruit or a protein, which helps, you know, maintain their moods and energy better if they're sensitive to sugar. Thanks. Um, Dr. McGuire, one parent asks, when do you allow a toddler to self-regulate their meal quantity versus regulating it for them? That is, take one more bite or allowing them to leave the table after only a few bites. Yeah, so I, you know, Dr. Stack and Marissa have covered a bunch of this already, but I think if you look at it, um, toddlers eat very different from kids of other age groups. So when we look at growth charts for infants, they're growing really fast. Um, whereas older children, toddlers and older children are not growing so fast. 
In addition, toddlers are really interested in everything that's going on around them. So they're interested in a bug, they're interested in what their brother or sister are doing. And so they may just get full quickly at a meal. So I like the idea, and we often see kids that will only eat one good meal a day. And then, so then provide healthy snacks so that if they are eating more frequently during the day, that there's healthy things available for them and that they're not making up their calories then with unhealthy snacks. Good idea. And, yeah, and I agree with never forcing a child to eat. Um, I just, you know, we don't want to do that. So no, you're going to lose that battle every time um, or create a monster, one or the other. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Stack, how do parents handle binging behavior? One mom specifically asked, my daughter knows what is good to eat or not to eat, and we don't have unhealthy food in the house but she still binges on healthy food and eats too much junk when not at home. Yeah, I think that's definitely a really good question. So I think that kind of brings us back to what we discussed earlier. Sometimes when a food is restricted, you know, from external um, factors, um, that sometimes makes you crave those foods, you know, even more. And so we want some of that self-regulation to come from within and to know kind of what's healthy, what's unhealthy. Um, obviously we have to truly examine, is it true binging behavior? Are they, you know, having any symptoms from overeating, you know, making sure that there's no purging behaviors afterwards? Um, you know, is it interfering with their daily activities, you know, um, from, from the binging, just the constant eating? Of course, we want to look at the cause of the potential binging um, or overeating. So is there a medical problem, like any thyroid issues, any metabolic issues? Um, is it boredom? You know, a lot during COVID when we were at home for some point doing a lot of virtual things, snacks were easily accessible and we were bored. And so we just constantly used, you know, or just had access to snacks. Um, is it stress, anxiety, is it depression? So kind of finding the root of some of the binging behaviors. Of course, you know, speaking to a nutritionist, speaking to a therapist, I think are important to figure out the root cause of some of those things are um, definitely important. Um, and honestly, with like the idea of binging with healthy foods, it's probably not as much of a problem because um, you will get full. Um, and so unless it's causing any um, symptoms or any purging behaviors with overeating unhealthy foods, it's probably not so much of an issue. Dr. Rakoba, I think you might be muted. Still happens every once in a while. I was going to say that's the old joke about the COVID-19, right? That refers to the amount of weight I gained during the pandemic. Um, Marissa, one parent writes, how do we teach tweens and teens to self-monitor calorie intake without making it a negative? Now, We've just discussed how not to make it a negative uh, in our previous questions, but how do we effectively teach tweens or teens to count calories? And I guess I would take a step back and ask the question, should we even do that? Exactly my thought. So this is a, a definitely a hot topic and a great topic to discuss. So, um, well, disordered eating in general has, has always been present, but since COVID there has been an explosion of cases of, of eating disorders. So when I think of calorie counting, focus on calorie, this is what I think about. Um, as parents doing what you can to speak with your tweens and teens in a supportive and educated manner surrounding feeding their bodies is so important. You know, keep in mind the diet and weight loss arena has grown into a $71 billion industry yet 95% of these so-called diets fail. So it's important to avoid speaking about calories. There's so many more important components to eating than just calories. Um, I suggest avoidance of food scale usage and body scales at home to help prevent the development of an eating disorder or hyper-focus on eating. Encouraging, which this word has been used several times, um, intuitive eating, which includes eating for physical rather than emotional reasons, relying on an internal hunger and satiety cues and unconditional permission to eat which means no shame, no labeling foods, healthy versus unhealthy, avoidance of black and white eating thoughts surrounding food. Like this is good, this is bad, this is healthy, this is unhealthy, I can't eat this, I can eat that. 
um, teaching to respectfulness and listening to them is super important. So quite often teens eat past fullness due to a lot of reasons, boredom, emotional eating, um, or just what is plated for them that may be really too much for their bodies or too less, you know, not enough for their bodies. Um, and encouraging, as we've discussed before, just balanced eating and adequate water intake. And if as a parent, you are truly concerned about your child's food choices, volume of food, emotional eating, the growth curve trend, whether it's this way or this way, I would suggest reaching out to your pediatrician and looking into, you know, a therapist that specializes in disordered eating if, if the calorie thing is brought up by them, not, not by you. Um, and just to also reach out to a nutritionist like me to educate on what feeding their bodies in a balanced, mindful way looks like, and just to normalize those thoughts regarding and surrounding eating. Thank you. That's very good advice. I, I would like to put in a plug here for something uh, that I read years ago that I, I think is a useful topic about healthy eating. And it's a book. It's very thick. It's very dense. It's loaded with a lot of good information, though. It's called Good Calories, Bad Calories. And uh, it really it shows you that not every calorie is created equal. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a worthwhile deep dive into how we could all eat a little bit healthier. Uh, all right, um, let's see here. The next question, Dr. McGuire, we've been talking a lot about diet and healthy eating, and we haven't really talked much about what we do with all of those calories. So what about activity and how do we encourage our kids to become more active? Yeah, so this is crucial, right? And hard sometimes. So I would say definitely make it fun, right? Anything that's fun, people wanna do more of. So it can be anything. If you enjoy biking, take your kids biking, try a new activity like playing Frisbee or go on family walks. A lot of people acquire dogs over, over COVID. So um, take your dog for a walk or take your neighbor, have your kids take your neighbor's, kid, your neighbor's dog for a walk. Uh, younger kids love imaginary games. So you can um, play those or set up an obstacle course for them. School age kids can do martial arts. The whole family can do, can do it together. Um, and uh, it definitely give ch kids choices. So you want, you know, it's fine to have them, you know, I want you guys to know how to swim and stuff like that, but then, you know, give them a choice. If they don't feel like they're the kid who's gonna, you know, wants to take swimming twice a week, that's fine. As long as they eventually learn how to swim, that's great. If they'd prefer to do biking, then let them do that. I know one child who biked to school every single day, um, just because that's what he liked to do. He wasn't much of a sports guy, but he would bike to school every day. And then I have another kid who didn't really want to do sports, but he would do dodgeball. And then he eventually ended up on the varsity water polo team. Oh, jeez. Burning a lot of calories with that sport. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, Marissa, this mom uh, writes in, what is the best way to encourage healthy eating for a teenage boy? My teenage son tends to eat junk food in secret. And this worries me, though I must say, I'm not so sure that's uh, isolated to just teenage boys, but what advice do you have for her? Sure. So I, I see this a lot. Um, just, you know, healthy eating in general involves taking, when you think about it, taking control of how much and what types of food and what types of beverages we eat. So eating in a mindful way and intuitively by listening to our cues is important, but um, encouraging and just having a discussion of, of replacing processed packaged foods when we're in the mood to snack with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, some sort of protein, some sort of dairy. But I would mainly really check in to see if he's feeling full after meals and snacks. There's always a function of why someone is sneaking food up to, to their room and, and why maybe there's feelings of feeling ashamed about eating these types of foods. So has he spoke about his body image, his confidence or his frustrations with his eating? You know, that's my questions. And, and if he's eating healthy, otherwise, I would just address why he feels he needs to hide these foods in his room, encourage, encourage him or her to, oh, him, son, to take those into, you know, the, the regular living space where everyone is and to eat those things and that it's okay. You know, why are we bringing it up there? I mean, if it's a volume issue, um, then that needs to be addressed and, you know, just have like a true real con conversation. And if that doesn't go well, um, and it leads to a lot of other thoughts and feelings, then 
you know, then you kind of have to, you know, reach out elsewhere to your pediatrician and kind of route you to the appropriate person to talk to. Thank you. Um, Dr. McGuire, um, one uh, question came in from a parent, quote, what are the future risks to the heart for kids wearing masks while engaged in sports? What do you have to say? So in general, um, most people can wear masks and exercise with the masks when they've looked at it without problems. So, um, you know, in certain cases, if there are kids who have, um, you know, more complex health needs like heart disease, um, serious asthma, not, you know, not just like an occasional need for an inhaler, um, then that might be a little bit different. But, um, but in general, most, most kids eat with, um, can tolerate a mask with exercise and we haven't seen problems with their heart from it. So, um, so I'd encourage you to wear masks um, when you're in a in inside space and or in your when you're close to people. Thank you. Good to know. All right, um, Dr. Stack, we're going to go back to you. I know you answered the question about underweight versus overweight. We have a related question. A parent asked, "My child is underweight. How can I help them put on some pounds without leading them to overeat?" How do you answer that? Yeah, and it's definitely a balance. Um, so first, I would definitely just examine if they are truly underweight. So are they meeting the criteria that they are below the fifth percentile? Or, you know, are they just on like the 10th percentile, but following their curve, you know, they're following their genetic potential, um, then obviously then that would not be an issue. Obviously, if they are underweight, we have to look for the cause of why they are underweight. So again, is there like a thyroid issue? Is there a malabsorption concern like with celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease? Um, so kind of looking at the symptoms and looking at the cause um, of being underweight because then the treatment is obviously different. So are there any heart issues, any pulmonary issues, et cetera? If it's not due to like a chronic medical issue um, and it's simply because of picky eating um, or just not getting enough calories, um, we always encourage a well-balanced meal and snack, just like what we talked about before. So we always want to pair a protein with our like fruits and vegetables or our carbs. Um, so peanut butter is a great way to get some calories, get some protein, get some good healthy fats. Um, avocados are also a great way to get some of those healthy fats in as well. We don't encourage just empty calories through like juice and depending on like Pediasure or Pedialyte, unless, you know, obviously there's a feeding issue or a problem where the child cannot eat certain foods. Um, of course, if we're underweight or not getting good nutrition, we can always add a multivitamin just to make sure we're rounding out our nutrients um, and really just kind of making sure that we're also getting a good amount of hydration and water intake. It's sometimes helpful to just keep a diary of what the child is eating. Sometimes, you know, we get busy in our day um, with school and different after school activities that sometimes, you know, snacks and meals even get missed. And so when we're truly conscientious of when our meal times are, what we're eating, we can kind of see where the gap is um, and what can improve the caloric and nutritional intake. Thank you. Um, Marissa, here's a good question. Uh, one parent writes, quote, my teen feels awkward ordering healthy meals when out with friends. Is there anything I can do to help? Great. So I would, I mean, my first thought when listening to this question is to better understand if this child um, themselves is labeling their food healthy and is concerned about what others are eating around them and comparing their food to others. But if they are eating healthy because of preferences, then so be it, you know, but if, it, if there's any fear associated with eating outside of their usual home food intake, then that should be addressed. Um, and if others are commenting on their food choices and they truly enjoy what they're eating and when they're ordering out, then I would encourage them to speak up and put a kibosh on the food talk around it. I think the most important thing is that they're enjoying their meal out, able to avoid comparing their meals and food to others and focusing on the conversation at the table. Thank you. 
you know, one thing I might suggest, um, this is a very simple thing, and uh, Dr. Stack alluded to it earlier, but uh, particularly when you're out with friends, uh, one source of what you've heard referred to as empty calories here uh, several times tonight, um, the biggest source of empty calories, especially for the teenagers, is what they drink. And they don't even think of it because it just goes down so easy and they don't think of it as food or as calories. Um, but that's the biggest source. So if you just tell them, look, when you go out, if you just, for the first you know month or so, all you gotta do is stop drinking pop or soda um, and just substitute something that is not, doesn't have calories in it. Iced tea, for example, just water, if they'll do that. Um, but juice, lemonade, soda, pop, uh, they all have a bunch of calories. And if you could just substitute something that is calorie free, that can make a huge difference in uh, the amount of calories that they're taking in. And, um, you know, it's simple, it's easy, and it's essentially hidden, right? People don't pay a lot of attention to what you're drinking, and they pay more attention to what you're eating. So something hey. that's not just for when the teens are out with other teens, but at home too. I agree, Ruben. There's 36,000 different kinds of frappuccino. So you know that there's a lot of advertising going in. Our kids are seeing this on social media. They're seeing this in, you know, places that they go. Their friends are taking them. So, uh, you know, if we can try to limit, if we can try to encourage them to choose water instead of some of those sugar-sweetened beverages, that would be great. Absolutely. I would comment that I'm not so sure high schoolers should be drinking that much coffee. But when you look at it, there's not that much coffee in there, right? It's it's all the milk and the cream and the this and the that. Uh, exactly. So a lot of empty calories. So, all right. Uh, Dr. McGuire, we're going to go back to you. For those who are already overweight, they're eating healthier, they're exercising, it can be a difficult process. Um, if a family is doing all they can, they're trying to eat healthy, they're trying to exercise as a family, they're seeing a nutritionist, they've joined a health club, all of that, but they're not seeing much progress. What advice do you have for those families? So um, it's been shown that the most effective methods are really intense programs. Um, there have been a number of like, for instance, a 26 week intensive program where the families are meeting regularly with the nutritionist, they're meeting often with their primary care provider, and then they're getting text messages in between these visits so that they kind of, to try to keep them on track, try to encourage them to choose healthy choices. Involving the family is really important, especially for kids who are zero to, you know, for under 10, but even into the teens, because a lot of times you're the one who's buying what comes into the house. So if you can try to incur increase the number of fruits and vegetables that are coming to your house and decrease the number of things that come into a package, obviously, except for carrots that come into a package and other things like that. But if you can really try to limit those things, then you're going to be going a long way to help people, help your family. Thank you. Uh, Marissa, I know earlier you had spoken about hydration, that sometimes kids um, confuse thirst for hunger, and we just want to make sure that they're well hydrated. So one parent wonders, is it okay to use flavored water drops like Mio to get kids to drink water? Sure, um, it, it's just fine to flavor water as long as the real sugar derivative is, is used and, and Mio does have sucralose. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, uni it's unique among artificial sweeteners because it's actually made from real sugar. So, I mean, there's a little bit of a chemical process to it that tweaks its chemical structure, but it's, it's coming from sugar, but I would avoid, I would just think about with all of these many varieties of, of flavored beverages, I would just avoid like the caffeinated ones, the, the vitamin enriched ones. There's just no real need for that and just focus on the original. Um, and having one flavored beverage a day is fine. I usually recommend, sure, have one flavored beverage like that a day. And if there's a real big struggle in getting sufficient um, water in, you know, we can, we can also flavor our water more naturally as well with um, different fruits and vegetables um, like cucumber, strawberries, lemons, limes, things like that. Um, but, you know, teas are fine depending on the age, like a decaffeinated tea or I decaffeinated iced tea. Um, and milk, of course, counts towards hydration as well. So there's other things to have besides just water. Thank you. Um... We can't have 
uh, question and answer in 2021 without mentioning COVID. So how does overweight and obesity interact with COVID? Dr. McGuire, can you answer that? Yes. So um, as many of you know, uh, being overweight or obese is really a risk factor for more severe disease with COVID. Um, we're not exactly sure, but um, researchers think that it's probably related to a variety of problems, including um, overweight and obese people often have uh, lower lung function. And um, then it's believed also that their immune systems don't work as well. So, uh, so go out, get your vaccine and think about some healthy habits that you might be able to uh, adopt for your family. Oh, thank you, good advice. All right, uh, Dr. Stack, um, one parent wants to know, you, you, you mentioned earlier rewards for good behavior, but not making them food. So uh, this parent wants to know, what can we use as rewards for good behavior or good eating habits instead of food? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, you know, kids actually really enjoy one-on-one -on -one time, you know, with their parents or grandparents. So if they can look forward to doing an activity that they love to do, so whether it's building Legos or, you know, playing with their, you know, um, dollhouse, et cetera, um, they can look forward to spending that one-on-one -on -one time, you know, having a sleepover with, you know, grandparents um, or their friends as a potential reward. We also, you know, want to limit screen time, but potentially, you know, giving them five or 10 extra minutes of screen time can sometimes be a reward. Um, and then simple things like having a sticker board that allows some of the delayed gratification for a toy or something else that they would want to buy. Um, and then other ideas would be, um, like decreased chores for the week. Um, so just kind of playing around with increasing the things that they do like and then decreasing things that they usually don't enjoy doing. Thank you, good idea. Um, all right, uh, Marissa, this next question is for you. Um, one uh, mom writes in, I'm trying to make healthier meals but my husband is a picky eater too. Oh, husbands are getting a bad rap tonight, I gotta tell you. Uh, I end up making the really heavy carb stuff that he likes, help. That's a good question. Okay, so um, this is difficult obviously because you want everyone to enjoy what they're eating, but I would suggest for whatever carb source that he prefers or the family prefers to at least make it whole grain, the whole grain version of it. If, if we love pasta, if we love couscous, if we love potato, you know, just making the whole grain versions like brown rice, brown pasta, things like that. And then couscous, you could get whole grain um, and just trying to avoid the white starches in general. Now it's okay, obviously for every meal to have a starch. It, it should really to have a complete meal, um, but not to be the primary focus. So as long as we have like a protein and a veggie on the side with it for everyone else, and him, if he could challenge himself with that, that would be ideal. But remember, he is a role model for the children as well. So trying new things in front of the family, him actually doing it is a good idea in case we have other selective eaters in the house at the table. And also another thing to do like behind the scenes with him alone would be to sit down and look at various cooking sites to come up, you know, websites, things like that, to come up with something new and fun that maybe could start being a staple of the week um, that he's willing, you're willing, everyone's willing to eat and go from there. That's good advice. You know, I wanna pick up on one thing you you mentioned sort of offhandedly there and that, you know, eating should be a pleasant experience. And I, I really wanna focus on that. And, and that's absolutely true. Eating should be a, a, a communal gathering around the table. Uh, let's share about what happened today at, at, at work, at school, just at home. Um, and, and you know, let's all get together, break bread, and it should be very, very enjoyable. If you've got kids, particularly as Marissa calls them, selective eaters, um, or toddlers, or you're trying to feed an infant, you know, mealtime is anything but relaxing and pleasant sometimes. It can be, uh, again, it, it often set up as a battle. There's often a tug of wills, uh, and it really shouldn't be that. Um, you should try and de-stress as much as possible 
meal times, and it should be a pleasant experience for everybody. And I think if it is, that will go a long way to making everybody sort of feel like, well, this is really a good time. I don't, maybe I will try the broccoli or the asparagus or whatever. Um, so uh, try and de-stress and uh, uh, make the, the meal time a, a little bit more fun and pleasant. I, if there's any one piece of advice, I think that's something that I would suggest. Um, all right, one uh, more question here. Um, this is for uh, Dr. McGuire. Uh, one parent writes, and my sister is extremely appearance focused and comments on my daughter's weight every time we see her. Now she doesn't want to go visit. How can I talk to my sister about this? Uh, relationships are tricky, right? They're um, probably the biggest and hardest thing that we deal with. So, I, you know, I think you need to have a conversation, a one-on-one -on -one private conversation with your sister and say, hey, you know, this is really bothering my son. This is really bothering my daughter. Um, and I, you know, I agree with you. It would be great if she, um, you know, ate a little healthier, but um, we don't want the whole focus to be on that. And just like you just said, we want the, we want dinner to be pleasant. And if she doesn't want to come, then it's not going to be a pleasant dinner. Um, so I, I, I agree. I think that we need to really focus on making, making the meal, it doesn't always have to be fun, but it, you know, it should be enjoyable and it shouldn't be stressful. And then try to keep in mind how, like how long, how people's attention are. So adults, many adults love to talk and take time to sit around and chat, but for kids, that's not always the thing that they want to do. So expecting them to sit for a long period of time may not work so well and may start to make it a battle. So have lower expectations sometimes doesn't have to be one minute, but maybe, you know, maybe for your toddler, if it's something you're working on, maybe it's going to be only a couple minutes if this is not a thing that they're very good at. And then you give them lots of encouragement. Hey, you were great. I'm so glad that you were here with us at dinner. And then they'll really want to be there. They'll want to sit there. But if it becomes a battle, then, then it's a lot harder. That's good advice. Um, the other thing I'd like to say before we close is it's been mentioned once or twice here, but only in passing. And that is, I think it's important to get in the habit and for your kids as they get older, uh, you know, tweens and teens to start reading labels. You'd be surprised at what you can find. Um, a lot of kids think, oh, I need to eat a healthy snack. I'll have a granola bar. Well, flip over the back of that granola bar and tell how many grams of sugar are, are in some of those things. Um, it's, you, you might as well go have a bowl of Captain Crunch at that point. Um, it's amazing what you can find reading the back uh, of the a can or the label, uh, the container it comes in, because uh, a lot of foods that seem healthy really are, are not very healthy when you get down to it. And you can start to educate your kids by teaching them how to read labels and to make smart choices. Um, we live in an era where you go to the grocery store and there's 20 different kinds of granola bars that you can get, and some are much healthier than others. So, you know, teach your child, read this label, look at this, has a bunch of sugar. This one doesn't, let's go with this one. Um, and I think that uh, makes them uh, more informed consumers and can help them when they're trying to eat healthier. Well, it is seven o'clock, uh, just a little past. I want to uh, respect everybody's time and thank you for uh, hanging on. I want to thank uh, our panelists, Dr. Christine McGuire, Marissa Persky, and uh, Caroline Stack. Thank you very much. Um, you will be getting an invite, I'm sorry, an email uh, with a link to the, the recorded session uh, from tonight uh, in the next few days. Um, and uh, when you get that link, uh, be sure to pass it on to your friends. There's a lot of good advice given out here tonight. I think a lot of people can benefit from that. So be sure to pass it on to uh, as many people as you can. All right. Um, Thanks again and uh, enjoy your weekend, everybody. Good night.